Welcome everyone to NJMEP's National Apprenticeship Week panel event. We're happy you're able to join us today. My name is Patty Moran and I'm the panel moderator. Before we dive into the panel, we wanna make sure that everyone who's listening has a clear understanding of what apprenticeship is. Everyone's heard the word, but I want to make sure we have a common understanding of what apprenticeship is. So apprenticeship is a system of training for qualified employees. It consists of structured on the job training where the apprentice works under the mentorship of another person. It consists of related technical instruction, what is commonly called RTI. And that the related instruction takes place often either uh, in a classroom or online. And sometimes it takes place at a community college or a vocational technical school. And it complements the work being done by the, what the apprentice is doing with the employer. Uh, most of the training is on the job training. Most of the training is done on the job. Uh, and also you should know that apprenticeships vary in length. Some apprenticeships are one year long, some are one and a half, some are five years long. So there's a variety of lengths with different apprentices. And some of you may know plumbers and pipe fitters and you think of those folks and they've served very long apprenticeships to get that, to get that far. So there's a diagram that um, you'll see that it shows the five parts of a registered apprenticeship program. And in New Jersey, <clears throat> we are registered with USDOL. Um, so the five parts are number one, business involvement. It is the foundation of an apprenticeship is the employer and meeting the needs of the employer. Second is structured on the job training. The apprentice receives on the job training under the mentorship of another person, under the guidance of another. Number three is the related technical instruction. They combine the on-the-job training with the related technical instruction, and many times this takes place at a community college, a vocational technical school, an industry association, wherever. They get number four is rewards for skill gains. Uh, when they, um, they get rewarded, they receive increases in wages as they gain higher levels of skills. And the last is the national occupational credential they do receive. So to say that I am a master craftsman in this area, that I have achieved this apprenticeship. So, um, so the concept, the entire concept of apprenticeship has been around a very long time. In fact, there are some famous apprentices that I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, I did a little research on this, and Leonardo da Vinci, he studied painting under his mentor, Donatello. It was a nine-year apprenticeship program. Jalil, can you imagine a nine-year apprenticeship program? Nine years. Oh, uh, it's a long wow. time, right? <laughs> Another I'll be 40 by the time that one. <laughs> yep. Another famous apprenticeship was Michelangelo. Both, both Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci started their apprenticeship at the age of 13, 13. They had very few years of formal education. They went right into apprenticeship at 13. Ben Franklin, he started at 12 and his father at the age of 12 was a candle and soap maker. And he wanted Ben to go under his leadership, his mentorship and make candles and soap. But Ben was a, he didn't want to do that. So he decided at the age of 12 to go study under his brother, James, his older brother, who was doing printmaking. So that was an eight year apprenticeship. And uh, he, he became a master craftsman by the time he was 20 years old. So also Ben was one of 10 children. I didn't know that. He was one of 10 and uh, he came from a big family and most of them went into some sort of an apprenticeship program. So these folks that we're hearing, they laid many important groundwork for today's apprenticeship model. <clears throat> so today we have a panel here of employers, we have an apprentice and we have an educator here. And we wanna hear about uh, how this training model works for them and what they're, what they're doing to support this work-based training. So I'm gonna... Jalil, 
Jalil Fenny is a graduate of NJMEP's Industrial Manufacturing Production Technician Registered Apprenticeship Program. Jalil is employed by Exothermic Molding, where he has gained hands-on experience in sanding, mold operations, and lean operations. Jalil passed all the MSSC credentialing tests the first time around and needed no retesting. And for that, we appreciate that, Jalil. Thank you so much. He is, he is a very proud certified production technician. Jalil, the apprentice. Are you ready, Jalil? I'm always ready. Always ready. <laughs> always all right, ready. Jalil, I'm anxious. I, we're th thank you for being here today. And I know Thank you're you all Yeah, you're right. And I know you even got a haircut, you told me, for this for this event. Yeah, got to look good for the camera, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's great. You know, got to sport the handsome face with the good physical fitness. That's it. <laughs> okay. okay, it says, we have talked about what the value of apprenticeship program has brought to business. What value has the apprenticeship program brought to you, both personally and professionally? Okay, well, I'll start with personally, and okay. a, lot, a lot of people know, you know, I had a rough background uh, as far as coming up. I lost my mom and my dad, and, uh, you know, I went to college. I made a bad mistake, as I said in the apprenticeship, uh, you know, inauguration. I made a bad mistake, and, you know, I had to come out and figure things out. And when I came out of prison, um, I went to the CRC, and... I had to, you know, a lot of the guys there, they, they weren't taking these opportunities too seriously. A lot of the guys there come, why do I have to come here? Oh, I don't want to be here. I'm on parole, this, that, and the third. Well, it was a lady there named Miss Scott, and she said, well, if you want to get a job, you do this, you do that. So whatever she told me I needed to do, I did it. And, you know, it led me to one stop with Barbara Walters. And, you know, I, I, wherever she told me to go, whatever she told me to fill out, uh, you, you need a resume, whatever you need, I got it done. And I got a job here at Exothermic Molding. And, you know, when I first started there, my background was always business. I went to college for business management and I was an accountant minor. So when I first got a job here, I knew nothing about manufacturing. I knew nothing about sanding. And... You know, every day I just tried. I said, well, if, if I if I get fired, at least I tried. That was my mindset. So I would just get my best effort. I would work overtime every Saturday. I came in overtime. I did what I had to do. And, you know, I ended up getting so good at what I was doing that they moved me to lead. And I started helping the guys and teaching the guys how to send. And they moved me to, the, you know, uh, department lead. And they offered me this opportunity to go to the NGMEP and one thing I promised my mom before she passed, you know, she was going to send me back to school so I could finish. She always wanted me to finish school. She was a valedictorian in high school. She graduated top 10 in her college at St. Elizabeth. So she always wanted me to have that educational background that she had and for it to be passed down generation to generation. And she always called me her smart kid. So, you know, and with her passing, I thought that opportunity dwindled. So when the company offered me this opportunity, and they said, you know, we'll give you a pay grade raise. We'll send you there. We'll still pay, you know, for you to go there. We'll still pay you the hours. You know, I had to survive myself, so I couldn't depend on anybody to, you know, give me money here, give me money here. I had to do what I had to do. So I said, oh, that checks out here because I'll still get my money and I can get the education that my mother wanted me to get. So when I came here, honestly, you know, I was always an intelligent kid, but I'm like, dang, you know, these guys probably all have more experience. So. When I got the guidelines and the study guides, I, you know, I did what I had to do. I busted my butt and all four tests, you know, I tested that higher than the national high average, which is a big accomplishment. As you said, I passed them my first time around. And I would say that so personally, it was an image builder. It was definitely a big help for my image because now when you Google my name, you'll say, okay, he started out going to school. He was started out on the right track. He made a mistake, but he came out. He had resolve. He had resilience. He figured it out, and he did what he had to do to survive. I would also say that it helped me personally in the way I help uh, the, the youth that I help. You know, I teach boxing. You know, I teach basketball. And one of the biggest things that, you know, this company teaches is lean manufacturing. And I got a little story on that. Uh my favorite boxer ever is Muhammad Ali. 
He would not have been the greatest boxer ever had he not beaten George Foreman. It's one of the biggest things that built his career, his character, because while everybody was scared of George Foreman, they say George Foreman would kill his guy. He said, I'm going to whoop his you-know-what, and he got in the ring, you know, in Africa, and he beat him. And, you know, it was a big accomplishment, but the biggest thing with George Foreman was down the line, you know, as great as a boxer he was, he made the George Foreman grill. Everybody knows, you know, everybody knows the George Foreman grill. Everybody puts their burgers on the George Foreman grill and it cuts the fat and everybody feels better about eating the burger because the fat is cut. Well, in in the workplace, we have two things. We have Hey Junka and we have Muda. We have, uh, and, they, and they tie hand in hand. And the Muda is basically usefulness, uh, uselessness, wastefulness. You know, we want to cut that out. So especially in, 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 you know, the manufacturing workplace, we want to create a one piece flow. We want to cut down on things we don't want to waste time on, um, you know, and that's and that's big in the workplace of what you work on. You want to make quality parts. You want to get the quality the customer, uh, the customer wants to meet customer satisfaction. That's the name of the game. If the customer is happy and they get what they want, you stay employed. The, the company gets money and everybody's happy. So that's the name of the game. And, you know, I also use it in boxing. I cut, you know, I teach the guys, hey, if you throw less punches here or you pick your punches better, like the guy Jim Bonte Davis that just scored the knockout the other weekend, you know, you you know, you you, you would you would be less fatigued. Moda was big, Hajunka is like the low management. And with the Hajunka, basically, um, you never want to give a guy too much. You know, you want to create a one-piece flow. You want to say, hey, your role is this, your role is this. My favorite basketball team was uh, the 90 Chicago Bulls of Michael Jordan. And the reason why they are, to me, the best team ever is because even though we had the best player ever, Michael Jordan, uh, each player on the team played their role and knew their role. And when Michael Jordan got that help of a, a team that uh, played their roles, they, they won six rings, you know, three. And then they went to play baseball, and they came back and won three more. So that was big. You know, you had Steve Kerr. You know, he was the spot of a shooter. You had Ron Harper. He was a great defender. You had Dennis Rodman. He was a hustle player. You had Scottie Pippen. He was the ultimate Robin to Michael Jordan's Batman. You had, uh, uh, you know, everybody knew their role, and and that's big. So, and that's also big in the workplace. You wanna you want a team, a company where everybody knows exactly what their role is. And this job and this uh, uh, schooling helped me identify my role at my at my company. It helped me understand that yeah, I may be productive myself, but you know it may not be specifically what this company wants from me. I've got to find out what the company needs me to do, so that we can make the customer happy. So it it, it helped me become a better team player. As well, far Jill, as it sounds like you're really number one motivated beyond belief and the fact that you have correlated and that's the word i'm going to use you've correlated your job function to sports and basketball and i give you a lot of credit because that keeps you going right when you make that okay this is just like this move and just like i i'm not a sports enthusiast so i don't know much about that but i could see where you made those connections and that helped you that helped right. you grow I actually had a friend that said, you know, a degree doesn't correlate to wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that's an absolute fact. You know, a, de a degree means you're able to absorb information. The wisdom comes in taking what you've learned and applying it to your life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've learned all these different things. I've learned tooling. I've learned safety. I've learned, you know, maintenance awareness, all of these different things. And I say, hey, how can I apply this to actual reality life, you know, actual life? And that's my mindset. So if I can apply it and help a kid here and teach a kid here this and use this there, hey, now I can use it at the company and use this in real life situation. That's big. So yep. yeah, I would definitely say it helped me on a simpler scale and on a professional level. Good. Okay, here's our next question. Right now we're in a very strange time. High school seniors are thinking about their logical next step while doing much of their classwork remotely. Okay. The many, there's many unemployed and some of them are considering a career change. Overall, what advice would you give them? Okay, now you have the adults that wanna make a career change. And my thing is, you know, as I said, I went through what I went through and I basically, you know, I was a business major 
My ultimate goal was to be a co-owner with my mom at LS Mini Tax Preparation. She owned a tax company. And that plan was shot due to a mistake at the time. So who knows what I'll do in the future. But I knew that me coming out of prison, I had to figure out a way, you know, to make money. So in and, and this time, it's not a time to panic, but it's a time to figure out what you can do to, you know, survive. And if, if that means you have to research and find different areas that you, you know, you, you can work at. My thing is you never put all your eggs in one basket. You want to always try to, you know, open doors and different avenues to try different things so that if, okay, if this doesn't work, I can make income here. You know, I knew nothing about manufacturing, but hey, I say, hey, if I can get paid doing it and you would show me how to do it, I'm going to do my best to learn it. And okay. that's the advice I would give the adults. I would say, you know, if there's something else that you see where you can be productive and make income and you believe you have the ability to try it and do it and what you're doing is not working, I'm not saying automatically jump shit, but if the opportunity is open and you can learn it, hey, take the opportunity because who knows with where our society and economy is going, what will happen in the future. So you got to take every opportunity and make the most out of your opportunities. And for the kids, for the students, you know, coming out of high school, a lot of kids really don't have a direction. We just kind of pick a major that we think we want to, you know, it's cool. When I, you know, when I was a freshman in college, I wanted to play video games and party and all of that stuff. But what I will say is three failures that I think uh, coming out of high school that I felt were, were big was the lack of education and credit. I would say the lack of education and Black history, me being an African American, and the lack of direction in the sense of a kid always feels as though if I don't go to a college or a Division One college, it's a failure, and that's not the case. Your skill might be automotive, your skill might be, you know, mechanical, your skill might be this. So if you can take a trade and you know make a career out of that skill, you will save a lot of money instead of going to college and wasting two years and being twenty, forty thousand dollars in debt. So I would say, you know, find your strength and work on your strength. Don't be offended or discouraged by people saying, hey, you didn't go to college or you didn't go here. You didn't take it this route. You didn't have to do that in order to be successful. So that's the advice I would give the, the students. Okay. What I wanted to say was another thing that it did for me image wise was a lot of the guys that went through the situation I went through now have more job opportunities because of me. That's big for my image. That's huge. That is Yes. Like, like, like you have companies that say, hey, well, I've seen Jalil come out of this situation and do this, and it was a success, and it's helped this company do this, maybe it'll work here. And that's big for me. I want to see, you know, everybody else flourish, you know, just like I flourish. That's that's my thing. I, I don't just want to win for me. I want to see other people do well. So okay. if I can help sure. somebody else's career success, that's huge. Okay. So so I heard a few things in there. I heard, number one, don't panic. It's not going to be the end of the world. Right. Number two, do research. Get to know your strengths. Get to know your weaknesses. Right. And, and um, it's okay to diversify for those adults especially. You know, right. they think they have an ability to do something. Sometimes right. you're going to take a risk. Right. And uh, I think that's that's a solid advice there. So good. Thank you, Thank Thank you. Jill. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for taking the hour plus out of your time today to serve on this panel. And we've heard such, I've taken notes as we've gone. I've learned so many good things and I have other ideas that have spun off of this. And I really appreciate this. I appreciate uh, all of your input. So uh, uh, USDOL was kind enough to send me some facts and figures to let me know Apprenticeship continues to grow nationally. In, since 2009, apprenticeship has grown by 128%, with 705,000 new apprentices since 2019. And in New Jersey, for the first time in six years, we have more than 8,000 apprentices. We currently have 8,252 apprentices, and that information came to me today. So it is growing. Uh, I am all about not just apprenticeship, but I call it work-based learning, preparing people for employment, different career pathways that they can enter, getting people onto that road of employment. So I do want to thank the panel.
But I wanted, we started today talking a little bit about famous apprentices and and I talked about uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Ben Franklin, but I cannot forget to mention Elvis. I'm sitting here with my blue suede shoes on, right? And uh, Elvis was a, um, uh, uh, an apprentice, uh, electrician apprentice, if uh, memory serves me right. So I wanted to end this with a quote from Ben Franklin that I think really sums up learning and connecting learning to the work. And he said, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, but involve me and I learn. And I think so much of that is uh, a lot of what we are doing and what our goals are is getting them involved in their work and making them passionate to go to work every day. So um, I thank you again, the panel, I really appreciate it. And I hope all our listeners are uh, enjoying the National Apprenticeship Week festivities. <laughs>